There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, our first uh, speaker for the seminar series for this semester is Dr. Sean Guller. He is the co-director of the UT Center for Planetary Systems Habitability and a research professor at the Institute of Geo for Geophysics at UT. He received his PhD from Lehigh University and his research interests are in tectonic climate interactions, the role of catastrophism in the geologic record, and marine and planetary geophysical imaging at nested resolutions. One of his current projects, which is the subject of his talk today, is the habitability of the Chicxulub and Rees impact structures. So thank you very much and take it away. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, uh, that brief intro, which is great. Um, I have not the greatest internet connection, so I'm leaving the camera off. If there are any issues, somebody just flag me down uh, <laughs> or, or uh, post in the, I can't actually see the chat. So just flag me down on the camera. It's probably the easiest way to do that. So, um, okay. So what I'm going to do today is for those who haven't seen it before, give a, you know, a talk about uh, the Chicxulub impact event um, to start off with, but then I run to quickly evolve this over into a discussion of impact cratering um, creation, creating a habitat for thermophilic life, which could then be a potential place for either life to get going, or if life's already on a planet, certainly for um, life to, to, to find a habitat um, that can persist, we think, for longer in the geologic record or geologic time than we originally thought. Um, and I want to give a lot of thanks to my, my uh, co-authors on the hydrothermal part of the story, mm -hmm. which are, are spelled out here in, on the screen but also uh, to the larger Expedition 364, which was the um, International Ocean Discovery Program drilling uh, into the crater. And that's all these names here um, on the screen. Um, okay, so, you know, folks in this group uh, certainly understand the role, I think, of, of impacts and impact cratering is, is really critical for thinking about the evolution of our solar system, you know, whether it be the you know, moon forming impact or the late heavy bombardment, which is much of what we see on the on the record on the moon today, um, or whether it be thinking about potential impact hazards, uh, such as the picture on the right, where all those dots are um, a near Earth object, um, where, you know, programs like Space Guard are watching for, you know, what are the potential of Earth crossing orbits um, as we move forward and in, in, in on human time scales. Um, but I want to spend time talking about impacts as a, uh, um, as a, as a major event in uh, geologic time, right? And in particular, talk about the, the one that we only one that we know of on Earth that conclusively caused an effect on our sort of evolution of life. And that's um, the Chicxulub crater in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And so if we uh, want to, you know, talk about that story for a minute, we have to talk about the uh, discovery of basically uh, the record of the impact globally, which was in the form of um, an iridium layer that was observed um, almost simultaneously in, in two places. There was the um, discovery by the Alvarez team. So Walter Alvarez, who's a geologist, uh, and his father, Louis Alvarez, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, who were um, basically studying the end of the Cretaceous era, the end of the dinosaur era, if you will, um, here on sort of the bottom right in this picture from Gubbio, Italy, um, and its contrast with the Paleogene that is sort of the limestones on the top left. And of course, what they discovered was that right in this boundary clay was an enrichment in iridium far above what could be explained by any natural um, uh, observation at the Earth's surface, because our iridium has is, is largely been, you know, brought into the interior of the planet. So you would not expect to see something like 9.1 parts per billion at the surface. And so they wrote a, a paper in 19, argued that this iridium layer meant that the extinction event that caused 75% of life to go extinct 66 million years ago was caused by an asteroid impact without knowing where the crater was or anything like that, just by the fact that there's this, you know, global extinction and this observation of the iridium layer. And then in, in, a, in a, one of those wonderful coincidences in science, Jan Schmidt was also making basically the same discovery 
in Calvacas, uh, Spain, and within a couple of months had also published independently. Uh, it says my internet's unstable. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Yes? Yes. 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 Good. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, so Jan Schmidt made basically the same discovery in Spain. And so he published a paper also in 1980 um, in Nature. So it's one of those wonderful coincidences. But both of them had the, basically the same theory that a you know, 10 to 12 kilometer sized asteroid hit the Earth. It's the only way to explain a, a global event like this, but again, without knowing where the crater was. And then in the ensuing, oh, so, and this is their theory, basically, of course, that 66 million years ago, all of these organisms here on the left go extinct. Um, and, uh, you know, amongst the survivors, you know, our, our ancestors, as well as, of course, the portion of the dinosaurs that made it through the extinction event, which are the birds, of which we have 10,000, you know, species of today. And fast forward 66 million years and we get a science party who can go drill the crater. So, hey, that's cool. Um, and, you know, in the ensuing time from 1980 to the, for the next, you know, 10 years or so, um, and then all the way up to sort of 30 years later, when this nice summary paper that we did came out in science, you could see that there was this incredible discovery of all the locations that had the record of this event. And so all the yellow dots on this map are distal locations where you have about a centimeter thick layer from mm -hmm. the impact that is enriched in iridium and has shocked minerals and things like that. But as you get closer and closer to the Gulf of Mexico, the thickness of that that layer gets larger and larger and gets more and more complicated. So here's an example from off the southeastern United States, um, the so-called blast from the past core um, in the Blake nose. And here it's, you know, sort of a 10 centimeter thick layer where you see, you know, prior to the impact, and these are just images of foraminifera, which is a kind of, of plankton. Um, you can see the incredible diversity and, and body size and so on of the foraminifera. Then we have the impact event, which is marked by this, this dark layer that's full of little glass um, spherules, little glass balls that were condensates from the vapor plume. And at the top of that, we actually have the shocked minerals and the so-called fireball layer, which would contain uh, the iridium and soot and everything else that associated with the impact, which we'll talk more about. After that, of course, the Earth's um, oceans are completely different. And this is just, again, a snapshot of of foraminifera as an example of what was living in the oceans, um, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of years later. Um, and in this case, only uh, four species of these foraminifera actually survived the event. Two of those species are evolutionary dead ends. So basically all modern planktonic foraminifera evolved from just two species that made it through. So, you know, major event in the world, world's oceans, and you can see the, the boundary is much thicker and more complicated. As you get closer and closer to the Yucatan Peninsula, where eventually the crater was discovered, we start to see all these high energy events. So we see things caused by the earthquakes and the tsunamis that in some places made the actual boundary, because it's made up of landslides, for instance, as much as hundreds of meters thick. And of course, where the actual impact itself hit was on the, what is the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, which at the time Time was entirely marine, so it you know in the southern end of the of the crate where the crater hit was probably a hundred meters of water depth, and on the northern end it was as much as two kilometers of water depth. So it was a marine impact, and we have uh, had in the ensuing you know decades lots of geophysical experiments over the crater. So this white line here is the northern coast of the modern day Yucatan, because now it's currently half onshore, half offshore. Um, and these lines offshore here are all seismic images um, like you'd use to look for, you know, mapping subsurface strata, finding oil, any of those kind of things. But in this case, it's used to map the impact crater. And so, you know, this black line here shows one of these lines that's down here on the bottom. And you can see these various layers of Cretaceous strata, including these really, really bright layers, which turned out to be made of evaporated ocean sediments, so mostly a mineral called anhydrite, which is a sulfur-rich uh, mineral, and how it kind of collapses down into the side of the crater. We can see, you know, bumps that may be rings of this crater and a particularly large one, which is sort of the inner rim. And this would have been the original crater floor, which has then been filled in over 66 million years. And the really impressive thing in this particular crater, which is unique on Earth, 
is this lumpy looking feature that you can see in the seismic data and which actually shows up as this light uh, dark, sorry, dark blue color, um, which is actually a, a gravity anomaly, a negative gravity anomaly, because it's made of very low density material, but it's topographically high. And so this is known as a peak ring and they're present in all of the largest types of impact craters. Um, and then, you know, using geophysical data, we were able to also map things like where is the actual melt sheet in the middle, where is their melt rock outside the crater, um, and where is the peak ring in, in three dimensions, and make, you know, cartoons like you see on the bottom right to sort of show what the, the, the geometry of this amazing impact structure is. And in 2016, for the first time, we got to drill in the offshore right into this uh, peak ring and through the overlying layers of impact related material, which we call impact kites. Um, and I'll go through some of the results of those and then how we're now leveraging this work into thinking about impacts as a habitat um, moving forward. Okay, and of course, you know, looking at that geophysical data and thinking about what uh, Chicxulub is, it turns out it's either at a minimum, it's one of these peak ring basins like the Schrodinger Basin here shown on the bottom left, but it could be a multi-ring basin, which also have big peak rings like this Oriental that you see down here on the bottom right. So these are, you know, the largest class of impacts, much bigger than the normal bowl-shaped simple craters or the or the central peak kind of complex craters like we see in most of the preserved craters um, on Earth. There's only three on Earth that are of the scale to be one of these big impact basins, and that's Sudbury in Canada which is about 2 billion years old, Bredeford in South Africa, also about 2 billion years old. Um, and then Chicxulub, which is only 66 million years old and the only one that's really preserved basically on earth. Okay, and so because of this highly preserved crater, also an impact that directly is related to the extinction of you know, the dinosaurs and 75% of life on earth, it was obviously an incredible target to go after to get samples of. And so in 2016, after more than 15 years of proposal writing, we finally got the requisite $10 million to go drill this. Um, and what we chose to drill is to drill the peak ring itself. Um, so we drilled starting uh, at the surface, but we cored, we brought back rocks starting at about 500 meters down, and we cored until we ran out of money at about 1,335 meters down. Um, and what you can see in this, this is again a seismic data, but overlain by the velocities of the rocks. Think of it as a proxy for density, if you will. Um, and the light blue is showing the impact related rocks that lay on top of the peak ring that are actually quite low velocity, low density. Um, and overlying that are all the limestones that were deposited on top from 66 to basically zero. And so we started core. It turned out in about the Eocene aged rocks 48 million years ago and cored down to the boundary and then down into the peak ring. Um, and just again, you know, highlighting where we are related to the crater on the right, this is the gravity image, but now shown as the first derivative, so the gradient of the gravity, and you can really see it enhances the image of where the peak ring is, um, as well as enhances where that inner ring is, which actually is co-located in the modern day with lots of water-filled sinkholes called cenotes that crazy people dive into and things. Um, well, it's not crazy to dive into it if you pop right back up. It's crazy to dive into one and try to pop out another, I think. Anyway. Um, okay, so there are um, three basic goals of this drilling, and the third one is the one I'm going to focus on uh, fairly quickly in the talk today. The first one is to try to understand how large impacts happen in general, you know, what causes them to collapse and form these wide flat basins like you see on the moon, you know, what's the peak ring actually made of. Um, the second were what were the environmental changes that led to the mass extinction and what can we learn about biologic recovery from this most recent mass extinction event. Uh, and then lastly, can impacts generate habitats for chemosynthetic life in the way that we see at mid-ocean ridges or hot springs or other places like that. So I'm going to introduce each one of these really quickly just as a sort of a hypothesis test that we did with the, with the drill bit basically. And the first was, how do you make peak rings in wide flat basins like this? Um, and there were really two competing theories um, as recently as 2016. And our drilling ultimately, um, and a paper that was also published in 2016 based on this drill, like, kind of, I think, has set this to rest. So one idea was that there's something called the nested melt cavity model, where impacts hit 
with enough force to generate huge amounts of melt rock. And in this model, the melt rock is sufficient to impede any sort of rebound from the, from the impact. Um, and that the sides then collapse in up against the melt sheet. And in this model, peak rings would be made of shallow, uh, shallow material that collapses and kind of lifts up to make a ring of peaks. Um, so if that model is correct, we drill into the peak ring, it should be made of things like Cretaceous age limestones and maybe anhydrite. Um, the other model was based on taking nuclear bomb uh, codes, simulations for nuclear bomb blasts called hydrocodes, or the, the modern program most people use is called ISAIL, available, you know, impact modeling software. Um, and what that does, if you scale it up to the scale of an impact crater, which is billions of times larger in this case than, say, you know, a normal nuclear bomb might be, um, it actually creates an instantaneous hole upon impact, which is lined with melt, but not as much as in the other model. And then there is sufficient energy for a significant amount of rebound to occur in the wake of the impact, which then becomes gravitationally unstable and collapses outwards. And then in this model, the peak ring is made of deeply sourced material that has basically come to the surface because of the impact. And so if we drill the peak ring here, we would actually expect crystalline rocks. And so that's our hypothesis test for this one. Okay, the second one was to ask the question about the mass extinction event itself. You know, it's a really bad day in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a map of the landslides just in the Northern Gulf that reach hundreds of meters thick. But the lead theory, leading theory of why it's a mass extinction event globally is something to do with the ejecta, such as this model you see here on the right from Artemiba and Morgan, where the ejecta is actually spread by Earth um, as dust and other particles, and that some of this stays up for long enough to impede sunlight and cool the planet and cause a mass extinction event. So that's, that's the running theory, but exactly how this works and what's in the ejecta that matters most is, is the key question we're hoping to answer by drilling into the crater. And then the third one is um, whether impacts themselves can be habitats for chemosynthetic life. Is it possible life could have actually started in an impact here or on another planet? This idea has been around for a little while, but gained particular steam after the discovery when they drilled into the Chesapeake Bay crater um, that, you know, the normal counting of modern cells in the um, in the rocks recovered from the Chesapeake Bay drops off with depth like you'd expect. So the, you know, this is in say, you know, millions of per gram sediment microbial abundances, right? Um, and you can, there's a million right there, right? And you can see that it drops off to almost zero at about a kilometer, but when they hit impact related material down at a kilometer and a half, it went back up again. And so there was this argument, this is, you know, modern day, um, microbial life living in impacts that maybe has, tells us this was a habitat 35 million years ago when this crater was formed. And so we also find something like this at Chicxulub. Okay, so with that is a big bit of an intro. Um, what we actually did in 2016 was to sail out of the port city of Progresso with the longest pier in the world out to the site over top of the peak ring. Um, we used a lift boat, this one here, which is the lift boat Myrtle. Um, it was uh, jacked up about 15 meters in the air and we put a land mining rig off the bow of it. We got onto the ship with this crazy thing called a Widowmaker, um, which I thought was so much fun, but others not so happy about it, but anyway. Um, and we had this glamorous um, you know, offices and labs in shipping containers and um, spent two months out here um, basically analyzing the ephemeral properties of these cores, including, very importantly, we had the microbiologists or astrobiologists on board to very quickly take the cores and, you know, in, in intervals, pull full, full sections out and then preserve the center of the cores, which should be no um, contamination, and store them at minus 80 degrees C. So they could then later be taken back and analyzed for any microbial life within them and hopefully to extract um, you know, DNA, uh, which was successful. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, about two months later, these cores went to Bremen and the entire 30 person science party gathered and did all of the analysis um, that I will um, show 
um, you know, in this, and then also show the follow-on work really targeting the hydrothermal system. Oh, okay, let's see. So I'm gonna start at the bottom um, of, of the core. So this is basically what we got. We got limestone starting at about 500 meters down and we drilled all the way through um, 1,335 meters of the, into the peak ring. Um, and this whole section of about 600 meters of the peak ring turned out to be made of granite. So very quickly, we already have an answer to our first hypothesis. It is crystalline rocks. Um, however, these granites are very deformed relative to what they would have been normally. Um, and they're deformed at all scales. So you can see, you know, in the pre-impact dikes, for instance, there were shatter cones from the energy. So these are, you know, made by a few gigapascals of pressure from the shock wave moving through. Um, at the crystallographic scale, so they're, you know, the quartz crystals, for instance, had planar deformation features that recorded um, shock pressures up to, say, 20 gigapascals. Also things like kinked biotites, ultracataclasites, and so on. But even macroscopically, the granites were fractured all the way through, crushed up rocks called cataclasites and ones that maybe had a bit more friction called ultra cataclasites. And even geophysically looking at the, uh, that's stable again, hopefully you guys can still hear me. Yeah, yeah, good, okay. Um, the uh, geophysically, the, uh, the physical properties of these rocks were completely changed. So everything here in pink is a granite. And you can see that unlike the normal 2.65, 2.7 grams per cc that you would expect, the uh, density of these granites, these shocked granites was closer to 2.1. Um, and the velocity where normally you'd expect like six and a half kilometers per second. Um, and the porosities were something like 10%. So these are fundamentally altered by the impact process um, and the building of these very deeply into a And so that's consistent with this model basically where, you know, again, these nuclear bomb codes scaled up to impact um, energies or impact velocities. So 20 kilometers per second, 12 kilometer asteroid. And you know, what it makes is something that rebounds 20 kilometers in the air, makes a final crater um, that's, you know, approaches if you put all the extra faults in 200 kilometers wide. And this, you know, peak ring, you can see the little blue that's shown there is sort of tracking peak pressures of the rocks that we think eventually became the peak ring. And they came from a depth of about, you know, eight to 10 kilometers down and are, then we're at the surface at the end. Um, and so that's representative, of, you know, sort of 9 billion times the energy of a World War II era bomb would have been magnitude 11 earthquake. And the latest modeling as the tsunami created was probably 1500 meters high. So quite an event. Um, and of course, we've been able to study these, these uh, granites in detail. We figured out that their original age um, before they were reproduced as a peak ring would have been something like eight or 10 kilometers down. And they were actually plutonic rocks from a volcanic arc aged um, in the Carboniferous, so sort of 330, 340 million years old. Um, but also we've been able to uh, directly analyze all the deformation of those rocks and notice that there's sort of an overprinting of styles of deformation. So fully crushed rocks are cataclastically deformed, overprinted by more finer deformations. So sort of the scale of the movements get narrower and narrower all the way then overprinted by faults and so there's this sense of the material being you know very low in cohesion and able to flow because it's just brittly deformed at all scales to then sort of regaining its strength through time such that it's able to eventually become this mass of peak ring that then deposits on top of the downgoing collapsed mesozoic sediments or cretaceous sediments that came in from the side and so a, a PhD, recent PhD student graduate of ours, uh, Naomi McCall, did, a, did some really cool work studying the fractures uh, of the cataclasis, cataclasis um, classically deformed and ultra cataclastically deformed uh, materials and actually plotting them up to show that um, they actually nicely agree in their orientation in terms of the, their, their, their strain with the predicted stresses, uh, the rotational stresses as this deforms. So we go, you know, go through this opening and then rebound and then collapse. And the, the, the pattern of these deformation actually matches nicely to the model. And then very interestingly, the lower little bit of our core actually 
um, especially in the ultra cataclase, it actually seems to have a different orientation than the upper part, which argues that maybe the upper 500 meters at the very end of this process is in place as a single block, but the block right below it may have actually had a slightly different orientation originally, implying that you know the whole peak ring is not one giant block, but something that you know changed in representative block size over time. So that's pretty cool. Why do we care about any of this from a standpoint of you know planetary exploration and so on? Well, what this says is these peak rings, wherever they're observed, is actually a sampling of a deep crust, right? So on the moon, for instance, this may actually sample something tens of kilometers down, which could be accessible, you know, to to a rover mission or to an astronaut, where we're actually able to sample, you know, something from the deep without a drill bit. So that's actually kind of a really important implication. Also, it had just an implication for planetary evolution. Okay, so that's the first part. Let's talk now about the environmental changes um, that were caused by this and what we learned from from the drill bit. So again, we're now focusing on above the granites, what was preserved there in these impact derived materials. Um, and what we see first right above the granites is an impact melt. And we actually know we have this big impact melt sheet in the middle, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. But, but even up on top of the peak ring, there's about 15 or 20 meters of melted rock, which is basically like a, think of it as like an impact glass. Some of it's been altered to clay. Um, and you don't melt rocks with an, you know directly with pressure until you hit something like 60 gigapascals of pressure, which is which is phenomenal, right? And and above that melted rock, we actually have all of these broken and brecciated materials that have melt in them, melt rock clasts in them. And so the term for this geologically is a swayvite. And we noticed very quickly that it went from sort of brecciated impact melt rock that looked like it had been shattered by some process to not, you know, very unsorted or non-graded looking uh, swayvites with big chunks in them. And then above that to this nicely sorted, ever finding upward material for the next hundred meters or so. Um, and amazingly, looking at the individual pieces of rocks trapped within this breccia, not a single one of these pieces was made of anhydrite or gypsum. So the evaporated ocean sediments that make up like a third of the target are actually missing from what is remaining in the crater, um, which is a potentially um, big concern from the standpoint of what was put into the atmosphere because sulfur is a climatically active gas, obviously, and so is CO2 from the limestone, of course. Okay, and so, you know, just some data showing that these, as you move up through these layers, it's nicely sorted, and yet it's not sorted down at the bottom where all those fractured bits of the impact melt rock are. And so the interpretation here is that right after the impact formed and rebounded and made a big you know, crater, it was actually open to the ocean in the Northeast. As the water resurged into it, it hit the impact melt rock and exploded and underwent these melt water interactions to leave some of those brecciated layers at the bottom. But then it filled in with this sort of, you know, sediment laden or turbid water that then rained out and the next hundred meters of material was size sorted and deposited over the crater. Um, and that's, of course, all on top of this active impact melt sheet that still would be liquid at depth, right? So even though it, it saw seawater and shallow, you expect it starts off quite, very hot and still liquid at depth. And so the hell of an engine to eventually make a hydrothermal system. Okay, and then at the very top of all of that material, we found about a meter of material. There was a, a layer that was a tsunami that came back as, as, as evidenced by things like charcoal and, um, and fungal uh, biomarkers from land that says, you know, that whole 100 meters, 120 meters of, of, of uh, impact breaches is about a day of deposition. And then this next, you know, meter or so actually turned out to have the iridium anomaly at the top of it. So that represents another 15 or at most 20 years of time in the next meter. Um, so it's an incredible, you know, resolution of time. And it also directly ties this crater for sure to the global iridium layer because the global iridium layer is in the crater, which is, you know, no more questions about this one not being the right crater, so to speak. Um, and of course, the lack of finding any of these evaporated ocean sediments, these anhydrides in the crater is a really key thing um, from a standpoint of thinking about the extinction. Um, because if you um, were to model 
at the pressures expected, um, three kilometers of sediment, where about a third of it is made of these sulfur-rich rocks, um, and then put them in the atmosphere, you get something like 330 gigatons of sulfur. And of course, that may turn out to be even be an underestimate because we didn't find any left in the crater. And even if you run a, a global climate model of a late Cretaceous atmosphere with just 100 gigatons of sulfur, you can get something like 25 degrees C of cooling globally, you know, basically rendering you know, the temperatures below freezing around the world most of the year for most of the world for something like 10 or 15 years. So this is incredible climatic event. Um, just from that's just the sulfur story. And of course, the modeling of the carbonate dust, um, which was Alvarez's original idea of what the extinction was caused by, that dust also would spread around the entire world and add to the global cooling effect, as would um, carbon um, from the target, organic matter from the target that would get turned directly into soot, petrogenic soot that would have also been put into the atmosphere. All these things together basically cause a global cooling event and you know, global darkness and probably twilight for, for years after the event. We think that's the primary extinction cause. However, life finds a way, and this is now tied very well back to this question about early life on earth, because some of the life that we observed that came back um, fairly quickly as there was burrowing organisms in the seafloor as early as you know, 10 years after the impact. But what was apparently dominating in the, in the, you know, the few, say, thousands of years post-impact, maybe even tens of thousands of years post-impact based on biomarker data was actually things like blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, um, which actually, it, it, it's a, um, and then eventually other kinds of, of um, bacterial life basically taking advantage of these low light conditions and this massive ecological niche as the, the plankton and so on went extinct. So these, if you will, these picoplankton um, actually take over the oceans and become the dominant life form um, in the shallow oceans in the wake of the impact. And it probably takes a couple hundred thousand years before we start seeing a real rise back of plankton as we think about them. Um, and that record is not just in the crater itself, um, but as we as we look around the, the world's oceans, um, we see evidence of these uh, rhomboidal structures that are thought to be related to things like cyanobacteria in say 30 sites around the world. So there's an argument that one of the key re recovery mechanisms for the world's ocean was these primitive life forms that kind of took back over um, you know, in the, in the surface oceans. And as those things died, they actually rained down to the sea floor, continue to provide food to the deep ocean that eventually after, you know, say a few hundred thousand years or a million years, it takes back over and becomes, which continue to rain down as they die and provide um, material to the sea floor. So what didn't happen in this extinction event was the sea floor benthic communities did not have an extinction event because they kept getting supplied by organisms raining down. So this was an extinction event of land and an extinction event of shallow ocean, but not so much of the benthics. And this seems to be an argument as to why. Um, so yeah, made, major obviously event, and we have some ideas of winners and losers and of, of recovery of life scenarios that existed. Okay, so that takes us to this question of a, of a chemosynthetic habitat. So we know that the ocean, when it was first arrived based on carbon isotopes, um, probably was heated up fairly significantly through these melt water interaction. There's some short lived evidence of maybe temperatures even above 50 degrees C, but fairly quickly the ocean had to become habitable again. But in the subsurface, you still have this incredible melt sheet and hot rocks that are displaced by eight or 10 kilometers that can drive a major hydrothermal system. And if we actually look at the minerals in the impactites and down in the granites, there's all of these minerals that represent hydrothermal minerals. So, you know, things like hydrothermal garnet was found, lots of zeolites were found that are hydrothermally precipitated minerals. You can see some of the cool pictures of these things, even things like amethyst and epidote and so on. Um, and and the you know the the temperature ranges that these 
um, are precipitated at are temperatures, you know, in the excess of 250 degrees Celsius, some are a little bit lower than that. So clearly out of the range of habitat for life as we know it, which has a limit somewhere in the 120 degrees C um, range. So at some point we, we make these minerals in the wake of this impact, but then we cool down. And as we cool down, presumably go from an inhabitable environment in the peak ring and in the impact uh, derived breaches above the melt sheet um, to something that becomes habitable. And how do and and of course that continues all the way until today, where you know as as we said, they took some cores on the drill ship and they preserved the centers in minus eighty, and they went and did active cell counting. And sure enough, in the impact breaches, there's a significant amount of modern day. Um, back, uh, you know, cell active cell counts that you can see, and even down within the granites at levels way above what you would expect at the depths that we're talking about. They were also able to extract DNA um, and succeeded in getting um, a series of, of, of uh, successful DNA extractions that appear to be uh, in the thermophilic bacteria or maybe archaea. That's something that needs more work, exactly what they are. Um, but uh, but and able to find basically active life today in the crater that is of a thermophilic nature, which means something that prefers 50 degrees C and, and higher, um, even though it's been 66 million years since the event. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, and we'll return to this point in a minute because we, of course, can look at these cores and get some evidence of the temperature time history um, of this event. So you know, normal, what they call zircon uranium lead kind of uh, dating um, of, or, you know, figuring out the ages of the granites will come up with ages, you know, in the Permian, for instance, that's the age that this pluton, um, sorry, in the Carboniferous, that was the age in the, that this pluton was formed. Um, however, if you use a different form of using these minerals called uh, zircon, and instead of looking at the, the decay from uranium to lead, but you look at the decay all the way to helium, um, which is which is capable of seeing lower temperature changes, you actually see lots of ages that are in fact younger than the age of the impact. And so why is that? Well, it turns out that if you have a zircon mineral, and this is a nice cartoon that Kat Ross made, um, that you know, has different ways for the, the, as the uranium decays to lead and goes down to helium, different ways for the helium to escape, the more shocked the mineral is, to the point of have, losing all sort of structure and becoming a granularly deformed zircon, the more shocked it is, uh, the more capable it is to lose the helium out of the crystal. And therefore, the lower the temperature um, that you can sort of reset the official age of the mineral, right? So if you get to a really high shocked mineral, you can actually reset it, even if you're only at about 70 degrees Celsius. Um, and so what that probably means is all of these ages that are observed here that we go from, you know, the impact age at 66 and in the zircon helium space, we see ages that are younger and even ages all the way out into the 50 million years. So more than 10 or 12 million years later, these ages probably represent highly shocked minerals, um, highly shocked zircons that are recording the thermophilic ages or ter thermophilic type of temperatures that are recording the hydrothermal system um, still operating at temperatures in the excess of 70 degrees C for more than 10 million years later, which is way beyond the initial uh, modeling that had been done uh, for the impact, which argued you might have an active hydrothermal system for, say, a couple of million years. But this evidence is saying actually perhaps this lasts, you know, uh, almost an order of magnitude longer. Uh, um, and so this, these two curves are just, you know, if you start off at at a, at, a, at a expected closure temperature of a normal zircon at 200, and you let the the temperatures either exponentially or instantaneously cool, you have this space where you can have closure temperatures, you know, above 50 or something like that, all the way down into say 50 million years. That maybe explains some of this data. So obviously, the next thing to do here, since we have some evidence that this lasts for a long time is to do some hydrothermal modeling. And so that's active work that Marquesa and myself and, and Naomi McCall and now our new student Soraya Alfred are all gonna be doing where we're taking these initial temperatures, something like 1700 degrees Celsius in the melt sheet and evolving this through time to see how quickly you think it cools 
And when does it go into sort of a habitable range of temperatures and how long do those last? Um, and to do this, you need to actually know something about the rocks and their ability to have water flow through them. And so the modeling needs to be constrained by the permeability of the materials. And so something that Naomi McCall did as part of her PhD um, was to actually do a whole lot of samples in the granites, um, in um, the, the impactites above, in the melt rocks, and then partner with other groups over in Stanford and Montpellier, who also did similar analyses of, of what's the permeability of these rocks. And the interesting patterns emerged where it turns out these shocked granites are actually remarkably permeable um, and even in fact more permeable than some of the breaches above, which is, which is quite a surprise. So these are just images of the granite and all of their fractures and so on. And it actually turns out they're equally permeable in the matrix, in, in the actual just granite itself, as well as within these cataclasites. Um, but then these breaches up here are actually a little bit less permeable and the melt rocks themselves appear to be very almost impermeable. Um, so that you almost had something like a, you know, an, a barrier to flow of the melt that sits right on top of the peak ring, which is interesting. So inside the peak ring itself, um, you might actually see a different system of, of fluid flow um, independent of these breaches up above. Um, and then also interestingly is this little zone of melt that we drilled through before we got to a different block that seemed to have a different orientation at the bottom. That zone, which was, we think is a fault actually filled with melt, um, it actually is also impermeable. So we may have within something like the peak ring, lots of barriers to flow in the form of faults and we kind of think we see that in little reflectors within the peak ring in these seismic images, um, like we see down here on the bottom right. Okay, so the other obvious thing to do is to move away from the borehole out into the crater in, in a broader sense. And one of the things we can do is take our seismic images and do some um, full waveform analysis to get these evidence of, or data on what the velocities of the rocks are. And it's really useful because it allows us to map where the really you know, clear portions of the melt sheet are, but also to map the, the suavite, and this is probably the coarse suavite with the big pieces in it um, that's not sorted out into the crater proper. And we can see that it's actually much, much thicker in the center of the basin. And then this low, lower velocity or blue colored stuff, so they get low density, higher porosity material, is actually also maps out nicely as sort of a blanket across the crater before all the limestones deposited on top. And in these layers, if we look in the data in the center of the crater, so this is line here is Chicks line nine, that's right here, and Chicks 10, which is right here, you can see these almost looking like upflow zones or almost like diapiric like structures in the center. And um, one thought is there is a, the active hydrothermal system is in some way creating instabilities and causing these upflow zones. And this, this is a, a target of active modeling we plan to do in the near future. One of the other interesting things is there's also an indicator of time because if we were to map the horizon between the Eocene and the Paleocene, roughly 10 million years after the impact from where we drilled it uh, at the borehole and map it out into the center of the basin, it would be, we think, approximately where this white dashed line is. And you can see that some of these upflow zones are happening almost up to it or even potentially past it, which is another argument that this system lasts more than 10 million years, um, which again is you know, beneficial from thinking about it as a habitat because the longer it lasts, the more potential there is um, for either life to actually get going from a, a, a you know, early you know, state um, or for if there's thermophilic life already on a plant for there to be the possibility of a new crater habitat to be transported to with or to have thermophilic life transported to it and then occupy it. Um, so either way, longer live life, living system is probably beneficial um, from the standpoint of this as a habitat or even a potential site for um, life to get started. Um, so what we'd like to do in the in the longer term future is to actually drill back into the crater again in the center of the crater and actually go through all of these interesting activities in the center that might be very interesting astrobiologically as well as from a resolution about what happened associated with the impact and into the melt rock. Okay, 
Um, and then one of the things we're doing to prepare for that is we shot a, a mini 3D survey over the original drill site and also one in the center that we hope to have some results out of um, in the next year or so. And then I'd also like to quickly compare this in my last few minutes here um, to a, a different impact crater. Oops, sorry about that. To a different impact crater, which is the Reese crater, a much, much smaller crater, roughly 25 kilometers across instead of the 200 that Chicxulub is. Also much younger, about 14.8 million years old. But here too, we've gone and looked at um, the zircon data, the little mineral zircon, using it as a proxy for the temperature through time. And also at this location, there is evidence of in using zircon helium data of a hydrothermal system that lasts quite a bit longer past the impact. And so the data shows this is the expected impact age here, um, you know, independently dated from other techniques like argon argon. And you can see that the more shocked the material, um, the zircons are all the way down to the white ones, which are these really, really shocked uh, zircons. So you can see that the age, according to those uh, crystals using zircon helium data, shows it to be younger and younger. And it, you know, it, it, you could actually make an argument um, that the, a hydrothermal system was present here um, for as long as maybe even a couple of million years, which is way longer than was originally expected um, just from the size of the impact itself. So we're seeing sort of a similar story in the Reese crater, a much smaller and younger crater um, than, than we, as we saw at Chicxulub. So impact hydrothermal systems seem to be a real thing and they seem to last for a really long time. And so this is an active area of interest for thinking about life. And again, you know, just to wrap up here, you know, one of the interesting things as an origin of life question is, you know, you can go through the synthesis um, to get make, you know, polymerization and you need potentially wet dry cycles. So you need heat and a place that maybe there's evaporation in order to eventually you know, force the polymerization, get these long chains that might eventually lead towards um, the ability to have something like RNA uh, and eventually life. Um, so that's, that's the excitement here is that impacts could be another place that this could happen. And we have evidence at least that of thermophilic life living in the ones that we sampled recently. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, stop there other than to say, you know, impacts are ubiquitous in the solar system and in the universe. And so if it turns out impacts are a way to do this and you don't need something like plate tectonics, well, it opens up a broader area for places that we might think about where life uh, could get started. And um, I'll stop there with a little cartoon just representing other theories about uh, Chicxulub. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. So I guess the uh, um, we'll open it up for any questions anyone may have. I guess the folks online, um, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. And we've also got some folks in the uh, in person who uh, could also ask a question. Okay, uh, Sean, uh, great talk. And I'll start off by asking a naive astronomer jargon question. Um, Please. Yeah. You were speaking of velocities. Were you meaning sound speeds in the rock or what? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I had two velocities I mentioned. One is the literally the velocity of the asteroid coming in. That was the 20 kilometer per second number, right? Uh, but the other velocity I mentioned was literally the velocity of sound through a rock, which is a okay, physical property, right? And it, yeah, and it, and it is um, roughly similar in, in relationship to density. Right, you know, you would expect, uh, you know, a more dense rock to have the sound speed pass through it more fast or more quickly. Uh, and so, you know, it's known that sort of an undeformed granite has a velocity of, um, you know, something like 6.5 kilometers per second, right? But these granites, because they're so deformed, it's more like four. So, you know, almost 50% less. Yeah, that's what I meant by that velocity. Okay, I got a, a question from Zayu Zhao, it looks like. I can do that one real quick. Uh, it says, uh, is tomography or FWI used in velocity model building? Yes, those were FWI, Zayu. That was Gail Christensen's work using the code from Imperial College um, uh, London, um, you know, with Joanna Morgan and friends. So that was, um, that's that particular full waveform velocity code. And that was published in a paper in JGR Planets uh, last year. Um, so we actually did a FWI of almost all the the 
line within the center of the crater, which allowed us to map out you know, where we could find melt rocks outside the peak ring and also help us map the exact position of the peak ring across the, the various data. It was a super useful thing, but it also showed us, you know, where that, you know, lower velocity sorted breaches, sorted sway bites were, and then how thick the, we think the unsorted ones are in the center, which is way thicker than where we drilled. Things, those breaches are the most important rocks to think about a habitat for life in the in the in the hydrothermal system although the granites too presumably uh, other questions ask another question then um another naive astronomer question here um i think you gave a, a, a really good argument that an impact can generate one of these thermophilic systems that is very long uh, Lasting and so forth. And if I think of other similar phenomena, um, for instance, the hot spot giving the Hawaii um, Islands that going sort of up to the uh, northwest of there, you know, we know that the, the plate has been going along. Should we expect a whole train of these thermophilic systems going across the uh, Pacific Ocean to there? I think all, um, hot spots, if you will, mantle plume systems um, absolutely make thermophilic systems. I mean, a great example that you can go visit, you know, easily is Yellowstone. You know, where if you go to those hot spots, uh, those those individual hydrothermal springs and geysers, you can see the whole range of types of thermophilic life. You know, the bacteria, the archaea, all the way through at, at a range of temperatures temperatures just you know present there as those pretty colors you can see on the surface in in and certainly there there is an active thermophilic system present at um you know mantle plume sites in the oceans as well so you 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 could certainly expect that the question might be um interrelationships between you know impact derived hydrothermal systems plume derived hydrothermal systems and of course, the ones that have been a favorite for uh, among some communities for years, which is just simply the mid ocean ridge, you know, hydrothermal systems and the life that lives there. So, we have a lot of ways that we are creating these, you know, um, on Earth. Um, I guess the arguments we've been hearing recently is that if it's actually underwater, it maybe is not beneficial to get life started. And so, maybe in the subsurface, not saturated like an impact um, where you could have wet dry cycles might actually might actually be more beneficial than say a submarine plume head kind of scenario hope that answered it bill yeah thanks yeah mark go ahead so sean you know now that I, it sounds like most of the data is in what is sort of the best estimate on the duration of the chicks flu system I, I think you briefly showed some sort of gaussian curves but i maybe you can yeah i think the best estimate from zircon helium is going to put it at what you know, 10 or 12 million years. I mean, you can argue those dates all the way to, to even like 52 is probably real. You know, that's 14 million years, right? <laughs> can you can you show that slide again? Oh. I think it was something yeah, like sure. this is A. Okay. Yeah, so instead of the Gaussian one, let me show the, um, let me show the actual data plots let's see do, 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 do. yeah so this you know this um that's that's a, a gaussian distribution is another look at it is probably here where you can see that there are individual ages with their uncertainty bars right well, some are even younger see. but screen. your screen hasn't come through yet there, there it is. Is. oh it's now we have it. So I'm sorry. There it is. Yep. Yeah, that's my internet. So you can see here that there's literally data in the 50s, right? There's even one that's younger than that, right? And so from a from a Gaussian distribution thing, it looks like that. It's not really Gaussian, but from a you know, so we've got certainly ages into the 50s, right? And so arguably at least 10. I mean, that's 66, 56 is here, right? So 10, 12, 14 million years, you know, is there's data for that, which is amazing. 
And at Reese, there's data that, go, that, you know, it's at least two, which is also a surprise. It's a much, much smaller system. Do we know anything, do we have any constraints or a sense of the, you know, 10, 10 million years after impact, what the temperatures are? I see. So that's the problem is we, we don't really without you. I mean, this, these thermochronometers are about the only thing that we really have where they're trying to look at, you know, there, there's been some attempt to look at clumped isotopes in the, um, you know, in the carbonate produce material in the oceans above and the initial temperatures in the oceans above were probably 50 to 70 but those cool off very quickly because it's exchanged with the world's ocean so that doesn't really tell us what the temperature is in the subsurface overly well so yeah you know, i think we need the model <laughs> trying to compare this to some hydrothermal model right Clearly something will continue to move. The question is, like, I guess, what temperature would you call it a hydrothermal system? I think that's great. I mean, to me, the key question is when is it in the thermophilic range? When is it in the hyperthermophilic range? You know, so when's it still above 70? When's it in that 50 to 70 range? And, you know, when we drilled the crater, it was actually the base of the borehole was approaching 70 still today. Right, so the the breaches were certainly below fifty today, right? But they may have been between fifty and seventy for way longer even than the zircon heliums are arguing, which would be sort of when was it thermo hyperthermophilic? When was it above seventy? You know. Okay, thanks, Sean. Yep. We have a class coming in. We have to leave. Yep. Oh uh, yeah. Thanks, Sean. No problem. Thanks all. <laughs>